your, your body is about 60% water. And, and I, I've recently lost a little bit of weight, and I, I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and do the math and see maybe I'm doing okay. And I, I did the math, and I'm carrying 19 gallons of water. It's no wonder it takes all I can do to get up these steps. And you know how much a gallon of water is? Well, I'm, I'm 19 of them. Maybe you do the math too, see how many you are. But you can't live without water, we know that. When you get dehydrated, you get all sorts of cramps and headaches. And actually the number one reason you get tired and fatigued is that you don't have enough water, <laughs> despite however much we already carry. Your brain will shut down. I mean, you just have to have water to live. And the fifth word of Jesus on the cross, in the Greek, is only one word. He says, I'm thirsty. I thirst. Now, a lot of the words that Jesus said on the cross as he was dying, only Jesus could have said them. Uh, but, but this one, we, we're all there. All of us had one time or another said, we're thirsty. That's why over the years they call this the word of humanity because it's something we all face, something we've all done. Check the words out of our scripture today. After this, Jesus knew that everything had been done so that the scriptures would come true. He said, I'm thirsty. There was a jar full of vinegar there. So the soldiers soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a branch of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' mouth. Now, it's kind of interesting because six hours before this, the soldiers offered Jesus wine with some myrrh mixed in with it. And, and he refused that. You, you probably remember myrrh from the Christmas story, one of the gifts that uh, the, the wise men brought to baby Jesus. You use myrrh for a lot of different things, but its primary purpose was a painkiller. I mean, long before we had aspirin and Tylenol, we had myrrh to help with the pain. And so right at the beginning, the Romans offered Jesus a painkiller mixed with some wine, a sedative, and Jesus refused. You say, well, why? Well, most, most Bible scholars think Jesus wanted to be fully focused on what he had to do on the cross. But now, it's six hours later, and look how your verse starts. The Bible said Jesus knew everything had been done. And so now he says, I'm thirsty. Now you're probably wondering, how are you going to get a sermon out of I'm thirsty? And I think we're going to do it pretty well. There's some things we're going to learn from that single word. And here's just number one. When Jesus said he was thirsty, it showed he was really human. You remember he was arrested late at night, went through a series of six illegal trials. No sleep, no food, no water. The next day the soldiers beat him, put a crown of thorns forcefully on his head, and then he was scourged with the cat of nine tails, they call it. You know, a lot of people never even survived that to get to the cross. And so Jesus was just, you know, in absolute pain before the day even starts. And then they put him on the cross, and that's probably the most agonizing form of execution invented. And now it's almost over, and Jesus said, I'm thirsty. Well, yeah, the most obvious thing is that this, Jesus is truly thirsty. He had been through everything they threw at him. But there's some other reasons. And, and I'm not downplaying the physical part. I mean, he was th truly thirsty. But I want you to see some theological parts to that. When he says, I'm thirsty, he's proving he's human. Uh, the central truth of Christianity is that Jesus was God in the flesh. He wasn't 50% God and 50% human in a way that we don't really understand. He's 100% God and 100% human. 
Well, Paul says it like this. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now, John, you remember him. That's who Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to. John would later write a gospel. The gospel of John in your New Testament is written by this John who, who takes Mary in. And when John is writing this book, it's a biography of Jesus, he has a problem in the church in his day and age. They call it docetus. These people, they taught Jesus was God, but they said he was never human. He's an illusion, an image. He only looked like he was human. When he walked, he didn't leave a footstep, a footprint. He was a ghost, a spirit. And John is really trying to teach the people in his church in his day, no, I was there. I heard him say this, I'm thirsty. He's making a huge point. Jesus was a real person. Ghosts don't say they're thirsty. Ghosts don't bleed when you stick a spear into their side. Ghosts don't cry out in pain. It was important to John to tell his people in the church that Jesus was real. He was human. But there's another side to that. And it's the second thing I want to say. It also shows he's the promised Savior. He really was God in the flesh. And, and, and this is going to take a little bit to explain, so bear with me. Your scripture said, so that the scripture would come true. Jesus said, I'm thirsty. It is more than just being thirsty physically. John says, so that the scriptures would come true. Jesus said. What's that mean? <laughs> well, for thousands of years, God has been telling the Jewish nation, I'm going to send a Messiah. He's going to come and he's going to suffer for my people. I'm going to send a Savior. And in the Old Testament, there are over 380 times that God says something about how the Messiah was going to come or what he was going to do. That's called prophecy. And the Old Testament is full of prophecies about Jesus. Now, for Jesus to truly be the Messiah, he has to fulfill all of these prophecies. And, and that is the incredible claim of Christianity, is that Jesus did fulfill these prophecies. Well, you say, what prophecies? Well, it's only 380 of them, so let's just go list all 380. <laughs> That'll take us to about 4 o'clock, so we... Obviously can't do that. How about the, the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem? You can't fake that. You can't choose where you're going to be born. Another prophecy said that he'll go down into Egypt and come back. Another prophecy said he would grow up in Nazareth. Another prophecy said he would raise people from the dead. You can't fake that one real easy. Another prophecy said he'd be betrayed by a friend or he would be falsely accused proven innocent, and still be executed. Another prophecy said he will be hung on a cross. And you know what's amazing about that one? David wrote that 1,000 years before they ever start crucifying people. The Bible predicted how Jesus died, or would die, before anybody even invented the form of crucifixion. Prophecy said that the soldiers will gamble for his clothes, and that's exactly what they did. Now the prophecy said that he would forgive them, and that was the first word on the cross. Father, forgive them. Mathematically, odds of all those prophecies coming true in any single one person is, it's astronomical, it really is. I've got to figure somewhere if you want to know more about it, but it honestly is one of the greatest proofs that Jesus was more than just a human, that he was sent by God. But get this, he's hanging on the cross, and it now says, they gave me vinegar for my thirst. 
What in the world is a jar of vinegar doing at an execution site? Think of the odds of that. One of the guys, the Romans, brought in a jar of pickles? I doubt it. You know, what's going on here? And who in the world would give you your vinegar if you're thirsty? You're going to love to see this one. What they gave Jesus was something called Pascha. And you say, what's that? It was the standard drink of the Roman army. It was the most popular drink among the lower class in Greece and in Rome for about 300 years. And guess what? When David wrote that they would give vinegar to the Messiah, they had not even invented Pascha yet. And I know you're saying, well, what's Pascha? Okay, here it is. You take wine that's spoiled. In fact, it's turned sour. It's turned into vinegar. And then they would water it down a little bit. And then they would add all sorts of spices to it. Uh, one, one guy I read on the internet, we said it tasted like watered-down mayonnaise. <laughs> but anyway, regardless, it was a tasty drink. And the Roman soldiers literally carried it in their canteens. The poor people drank it. Slaves would drink it. Because it's inexpensive. It doesn't cost anything. It, you take wine that's already run its course. It's ruined. And you mix it up into this concoction. Here's the crazy thing. It wasn't really that bad for you. Uh, it covered up the bad taste of a lot of water supplies. It, it actually would kill bacteria that would often be in water supplies from here and there. It had vitamin C, you know, that helps with scurvy and all that. It was good for the soldiers. They didn't know it. They didn't realize it. They just drank it. So the soldiers are going to go out and spend the entire day executing. And so, yeah, they brought a, a tank full of Pascha along with them. Vinegar water, exactly what David said was going to happen. But check this out. They get a hyssop branch. Put a sponge on it and reach it up for Jesus to drink. But they don't realize what they've just done because any Jew standing there automatically would realize the importance of hyssop. Okay, you're saying, okay, I don't know. I missed that in Sunday school. Well, you have to go back to the, the movie Ten Commandments. How many saw Charlton Heston? Yeah, you're showing your age <laughs> like I'm showing my age now too. Long, long, long before Jesus lived, God's people were in Egypt. And at first it was friendly. But after 400 years of being in, in, in Egypt, they became slaves of the Egyptians. And so God raised up a man named Moses. And God told Moses to set my people free. So Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, nope, not going to happen. So at this point, God sends a series of plagues. You, you remember these from Sunday school. Each one of these plagues is a slam on an Egyptian god. For example, the Egyptians worship frogs. God says, well, you like frogs? Have at it, and the place was overrun with frogs. Egyptians worship cows. And God said, okay, all your cows are going to get sick. The Egyptians worship the Nile River. God says, well, let's turn it red, just like blood. See how you like that. Because every one of these plagues, it's making fun of a, an Egyptian god. And unfortunately, the Egyptians also worship their firstborn. And you remember that the final plague was the death of the firstborn. Now, if you do remember the story from Sunday school, you re realize that every household was required to spread blood, basically, around the doorposts. And then that evening, the death angel would pass over. That's where we get the holiday, Passover. It's still a very strong Jewish holiday because this is the day the death angel passed over. Now, how did he do that? I know here's where I'm coming to. 
Moses writes this, take a branch of the hyssop plant, dip it into the bowl filled with blood, and then wipe the blood on the sides and tops of the door frames. Every Jew in Jerusalem that would ever become a Christian totally understood what was happening when the soldiers unknowingly raised a hyssop branch. And they would forever connect Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so when Jesus said, I'm thirsty, yeah, sure, he is thirsty. But he's proven his humanity, he is fulfilling prophecy, his divinity. The last thing I want to share with you today, quickly, is it shows us how much Jesus really does love us. Romans 5 says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, uh, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. That's called redemption, and it's another one of those church words we say all the time and seldom define it. It's pretty easy. It means to buy back. If you get short on some cash and you sell your favorite guitar to the pawn shop and your best friend goes down and buys it back for you, he's redeemed it. And that's exactly what redemption is. Jesus paid the price. Now, years ago when I first you know, put these things together and you know, it's a pretty popular sermon to look at these last seven words of Jesus. I learned something that I really didn't know, and it might be new for you too. That phrase that we use today, I thirst, that was the life verse of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was a nun who founded the Missionaries of Charities and Home for the Dying, not just in Calcutta with the lepers and, and so forth, but literally all over the world. And in every one of these buildings, you will find a picture of Jesus on the cross with the words, I thirst. Because Mother Teresa said that really is our duty, to quench the thirst of Jesus by helping those who are still thirsty. She said we can't change anything with Jesus because that's already happened. But we have a duty to help those around us. Now, nobody's going to ever come up to you and say, hey, I'm spiritually thirsty. We don't talk like that much. But they will come up to you and say, I'm bored. I'm unhappy. I just don't feel fulfilled in my life. And that's a spiritual thirst. Or I'm unsatisfied. I'm, my life is empty. There's got to be more. That's spiritual thirst. I'm stressed out. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. I'm barely hanging on. Yeah, people are still spiritually thirsty. And the Bible talks about that all the time, about the questions, the big ones. Why am I here? It, what's the purpose of life? Where did it come from? Where am I going? And you know, I think Mother Teresa was right. We quenched Jesus' thirst when we quench the thirst of other people. And we do that by serving. And that's what defines us as a group of believers. But even more than that, I want you to listen to some words of Jesus. He says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your house. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Well, then the righteous ones will say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and gave you clothing? When, we did, when did we ever see you sick and in prison? And the king will say, I'll tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Every time you have opportunity to do good to someone else, you are quenching the thirst of Jesus. 
And he goes further and says, even if you give a, a cup of cold water, you'll be rewarded. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a teacher. You just got to give a cup of cold water to somebody who really needs it. I mean, after all, isn't that what defines us as believers? Showing love to those in need. Beyond that even, Jesus says, if your enemies are hungry, Paul writes this, give them food to eat. If they're thirsty, give them water to drink. Okay, they hate you. <laughs> they want to hurt you. You don't like their lifestyle. You may not agree with their political views. But Jesus says, if they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Isn't that what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to adopt his lifestyle and his, his practices and obey his teaching? Even to those who might be your enemy. It's more, Jesus was totally aware of the words he chose on the cross. He says this on one occasion. It says he stood there and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. Talking about just plain old earthly water. But those who drink the water I will give will never be thirsty again. It will become a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Praise team, come on down. Bottom line is this. If you feel unsatisfied with your life, if you feel that there's got to be more and that you're missing something so great and grand, that's a spiritual thirst. And the only one who can ever quench that thirst is the same one who hung on a cross and said, I thirst. He became thirsty so that you and I never have to be thirsty again. He truly is our all in all. He truly is the Lamb of God. Would you stand as we share a final song?